Welcome, I'm Corey Keller. I'm an assistant professor at Stanford University, and I am excited to present to you today on electrophysiology guided brain stimulation. This is what a patient handed me in my first year of residency. It was a note that said, I'm afraid of this evaluation process. The diagnosis depends on me, what I say, and I don't trust myself with anything. I never had. I say something one moment, but later it's not what I feel, so how will they know? I want them to use machine slash technology to examine my brain to really know what is wrong with me. This perfectly aligns with my career goals to develop objective, personalized, and real-time diagnostic and treatment solutions for mental health disorders. I hope at the end of this talk, you can take with you that interventional psychiatry is an emerging field with tons of potential but to personalize and increase efficacy, we need to fill some large gaps. That includes developing objective brain biomarkers to monitor during treatment, mapping these brain biomarkers to multidimensional stimulation parameters, and optimizing real-time monitoring for closed-loop stimulation. If we can do that, we will have a personalized treatment with minimal side effects that can be applied to any brain circuit and any neuropsychiatric disorder. So let's start with depression. Everyone knows depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide, and COVID has only made those numbers worse. About a third of our patients have treatment-resistant depression. For these patients, we have this space of interventional psychiatry. We have our TMS, or transcranial magnetic stimulation devices, all of which are FDA cleared. We have our other brain stimulation methods, some of which are cleared and some are coming down the pipeline, and this interesting space of psychedelics. I'm going to focus my talk on TMS because it is the most common outpatient procedure for treatment-resistant depression. Now, TMS is everywhere at this point. It's in every major hospital. It's in many outpatient clinics. We have multiple different treatment protocols, all of which are clinically effective based on randomized clinical trials. We have these interesting novel treatment patterns like accelerated theta burst but we still lack a mechanistic understanding of how TMS actually gets into the brain and modulates brain circuits. We don't have these brain biomarkers to stratify, predict, and track outcome. And we can't change this biomarker or biomarkers because we don't have them yet. So what do we know? Well, we know that single pulses of TMS generate time-varying magnetic fields that penetrate the skull and induce action potentials. We know that in non-human primates, that single pulses of TMS can elicit action potentials within five milliseconds of the pulse. This is not true with sham stimulation. We also know in humans that single pulses of TMS applied to the motor cortex can elicit a motor evoked potential through the corticospinal tract. So no one's going to dispute that TMS can get into the brain and cause action potentials. What is more controversial is how repetitive TMS or patterned TMS actually modulates brain circuits and induces brain plasticity. So this plasticity idea derives from animal models where high frequency, 100 hertz electrical stimulation to the hippocampus can induce long lasting changes in the EPSP or IPSP or the evoked potential. Bring that up to motor cortex and turn down the frequency so you don't cause seizures. We have our initial 10 hertz TMS treatment. And this treatment, while some studies show an increase in the motor evoked potential when you apply 10 hertz stimulation to motor cortex, other studies are not so clear. In this study, there's not a consistent effect of how 10 hertz RTMS to the motor cortex modulates the motor evoked potential. And a more recent study that looked at continuous theta burst and inhibit and intermittent theta burst, which are thought to be inhibitory and excitatory respectively, across a lot of subjects had no net change in the motor of both potential. So even in the motor cortex, where we have a really high signal to noise output in that motor of both potential, it's not super clear what these TMS protocols do. And furthermore, outside of the motor cortex is even less clear. So what do we think we're doing? Well, we think in depression, we have a hypoactive dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, or DLPSC, and a hypoconnected frontal parietal network as a result. 
this decrease in top-down inhibition of the default mode network in yellow and the salience network in red allow those networks to become hyper-connected and are thought to underlie a lot of the depressive symptoms that we see. Now we think TMS can upregulate that DLPFC region, normalize the frontal parietal network in blue, and normalize the amount of top-down inhibition in the default mode network and saliency network. There's some imaging uh, studies to show this, but not a ton. What we'd like to be able to do is given an abnormal brain circuit in a disorder, we want to know what the fundamental principles are to turn up or turn down that circuit. If we can do that, we have a treatment that has unlimited applications with minimal side effects. TMS is already FDA cleared for all of these disorders in bold. And my guess is that five years from now, all of these disorders will be cleared. Now, there is a hidden agenda here, and that's with basic neuroscience. The basic human neuroscience, we don't have the tool to causally enhance or inhibit a given network. And so if we could do that with TMS in a very similar manner, we could explore what the functional and behavioral um, downstream effects are from modulating that circuit, which would be hugely beneficial. So why aren't we there? Well, it's a number of reasons. The first, like I said before, is we lack this objective brain biomarker that could be monitored in the clinic, could measure target engagement, and relate to symptom change. We don't have a great understanding of this multidimensional parameter space. We have this two-dimensional space where we have 10 hertz, one hertz, and theta burst stimulation. These are our treatments for TMS for depression. But Outside of this, we don't know what these other patterns and other frequencies do. Furthermore, this is our two-dimensional space. We have a 10-dimensional space. Location, frequency, state dependence, number of sessions, intersession spacing. I can go on and on. And we need to start moving towards this multi-dimensional analysis to better understand the interactions between these stimulation parameters. We Doing TMS studies in the lab or in the clinic is enormously resource heavy. A TMS study typically takes hundreds of patients treated for a month or more, and that has a huge burden on the lab or the clinic. I wanna bring that down to an N of one study and a one day study where we can, in a crossover manner, study the effect of let's say 10 different treatments in a low dimensional space. And eventually, we need to move towards monitoring in real time and adapting treatment with closed loop solutions. So this is our lab. We focus on neuromodulation and human electrophysiology. The lab deconstructs brain stimulation to establish fundamental mechanisms underlying human neuroplasticity and develop real time closed loop treatments for mental health disorders. We do this by developing novel methods to probe the human brain in a causal and directional manner. We try to better understand the fundamental mechanisms underlying human brain plasticity and create real-time closed-loop solutions. We use three preparations to do this. The first is a fully invasive intracranial approach. So these are patients with medically intractable epilepsy that undergo surgery and they get up to 300 electrodes placed into their brain. We can, using focal electrical stimulation, stimulate certain brain regions like the DLPFC in a pattern that is very similar to what we do in the clinic, let's say 10 hertz stimulation. And then we can explore using these intracranial electrodes that have very high signal to noise and high spatial and temporal resolution, we can explore the effects of that repetitive stimulation pattern. Now, the caveat here is this is electrical stimulation and not TMS, and these are epilepsy patients. So the generalizability is called into question. On the other side of the spectrum is a fully non-invasive approach. This can get into the clinic. We can study healthy controls. We can study patients with depression with simultaneous TMS and EEG recordings on the scalp. I'll explain this in a little bit. And then we have the new kit on the block, which I'll present here, and that's TMS IEEG. 
which is basically a combination of these two methodologies where we utilize a TMS coil in these epilepsy patients, and we can record with really high signal to noise the intracranial local field potential response. And the hope is that we can go back and forth between these methodologies, which can be hugely beneficial. So we start with the left most and explore how novel treatment patterns may change the brain in a ground truth type of manner. Then we bring that up to TMS CEG and see if we can explore and measure those changes that we see inside the brain. In the clinic, after a clinical trial, we may see that there's some EEG response that changes in an active TMS group. And we want to explore the underlying neurophysiology of that. We can bring that back down to the leftmost methodology and explore where in the brain and what brain signals uh, correlate or relate to those non-invasive measurements. So I hope to start intracranially and then bring you guys up non-invasively. <coughs> So intracranially, as I mentioned before, we have grid and strip and depth electrodes that are implanted into the brain of these epilepsy patients. And we can localize where these electrodes are based on a preoperative MRI and a post-op CT. We helped disseminate an approach called corticocortical evoked potentials, or CCEP mapping, which is a causal and directional way to probe human brain connectivity. Very simply, we apply single pulses of electrical stimulation in a biphasic and bipolar manner and measure the evoked potentials at other regions of the brain. We measure the latency and the amplitude of those evoked potentials and get a sense of how connected these brain regions are. We can use these networks measured with CCEPs and relate those to seizure networks. We can relate those to other non-invasive non-causal methods of functional connectivity like resting fMRI. And we can use these tools to probe brain excitability after some intervention. So in this study here, we have one patient just to show you. We apply stimulation in the DLPSC and record in the parietal region. This is a single trace of CCEP mapping where we're applying single pulses of electrical stimulation and you can see the strong evoked potential about 30 milliseconds afterwards on a single trial level. When you ask where in the brain do you see those evoked responses, you see them locally and in more distant and connected regions. So then we apply our intervention, and in this case, it was 10 hertz stimulation. We mimic this 10 hertz pattern like TMS. So five seconds on, 10 seconds off, 3,000 total pulses. And then using CCEPs after stimulation, we asked what brain regions changed, how long lasting were those changes. We just look at this one region in the parietal lobe, we see this type of response. What you see is a suppression of the evoked potential or a modulation of the evoked potential that lasts for about 20 minutes. We were able to predict which brain regions across a group of about 14 patients which brain regions would change based on the anatomical distance from the stimulation site and the functional connectivity at baseline from the strength of the evoked potentials. In the second study, we dove into the 10 hertz stimulation itself, and we were able to monitor the evoked potential after each stimulation pulse, asking questions like, how does a single train of 50 pulses modulate the evoked potential throughout the train? How do repeated trains of stimulation um, cause the evoked potential to evolve during this treatment pattern? And we can fill in these blanks. So like I had mentioned before, just in the summary, I hope to have shown you that this electrical stimulation approach, it can be a powerful combination with maximal focality and recording signal to noise that with the CCP approach, we can probe brain changes after TMS pattern stimulation. And that 10 hertz electrical stimulation patterned like TMS induces brain changes for about 20 minutes. And these brain changes are predictable. Now going up one step in the translational path, we want to do a similar type study, but use TMS coils. So we want to explore the local and downstream neural effects of single pulse TMS in humans 
using these brain recordings that have high spatial and temporal resolution. So that's where TMS IEG comes in. This is a long-standing collaboration that I have recently joined. Hiroki Oya at the University of Iowa has performed all of the phantom brain testing. And Aaron Boas down at the University of Iowa has managed the patients and performed the TMS experiments in the last 20 epilepsy patients down there. A rotating grad student in my lab, Jeffrey Wang, was looking for a project and I was speaking to Aaron at that point in time and we decided to collaborate and Jeffrey's been working on all of the data analysis. So this is Hiroki's work. In terms of the phantom brain, we need to make sure that this is a safe approach to apply TMS pulses with electrodes placed into the brain. The summary here is that TMS did not cause any heating within the electrodes. TMS did not displace any of the electrodes, even close to the coil. And TMS induced gradients in the electrodes that were safe. They then started uh, taking these implanted patients and applying TMS. And in the last 20 patients that have received a variety of stimulation patterns, no adverse events have occurred. And no seizures were observed because of participation in these studies. So in a subset of these 20 patients, we were able to apply single pulses of TMS to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is the treatment site for depression. So we applied single pulses of TMS, 50 pulses every two seconds, and we had a sham condition, which was a flipped coil to get the auditory click, the sen sensory effect, and study that compared to the true TMS direct effect. So we looked at intracranial TMS evoked potential. This is just one patient, one electrode, where you can see single pulses of TMS to the DLPFC induced a strong evoked potential in this channel compared to sham single pulses. There were other channels where you didn't see much of a separation, suggesting that this is a sensory effect, and other channels where we saw no change whatsoever. So if you just look at this single patient and look at the distribution of TMS greater than sham regions, which were regions that showed a strong ITEP, we see this. You see a distributed map of significant brain responses that were elicited based on TMS and not sham. And then you see these focal uh, TMS equals sham or sensory of both responses which are localized to bilateral auditory cortices as expected. Now, the first question we asked here on a group level is does single pulses of TMS induce local ITEPs within the DLPSC? So this is a complicated figure, but I want you to focus on the green dot, which was where the TMS is applied, and the black dot which is where we saw significant evoked potentials within three centimeters of the stimulation site. Now, the first thing you can see is you actually see a lot of white electrodes, which is no separation between TMS and sham. And actually only about 18% of those electrodes demonstrated this strong ITEP effect. We hypothesize that this effect may be driven by the electrical field strength, that those regions that have a stronger electrical field from the TMS coil, those would be the regions that showed a strong evoked potential. So this is the electrical field simulation and the percentage of electrodes that were significant from an ITEP point of view. You can see that there's some overlap. And sure enough, those regions that had a stronger electrical field did have a stronger evoked response. But the effect was somewhat weak and the correlation was more like 0.4. So this um, relationship really only explained about 16% of the variance. The second question we asked was, how about downstream effects? How does single pulses of TMS induce downstream brain regions, if at all? This is what we saw. This was eight subjects. What you're seeing here is ipsilateral brain regions that are activated or that respond with significant ITEPs 
after single pulses to the DLPSD. What you can see here is you see the anterior cingulate cortex, the insula, and the DLPSD light up. We saw similar maps contralaterally. When you plot this on the brain, you see this effect, whereas the ACC is the strongest, clearest effect, and some in the insula as well. This is just three patients that have examples of those ITEPs in the ACC after single pulses to the DLPSD. So this was interesting. Um, the worry that we had here was that this was all saliency, that the ACC and insula are in the saliency network. So is TMS just inducing uh, these evoked potentials in these brain regions purely because the TMS pulse is salient? So we did a couple control analyses. The first one was looking at the functional connectivity, the resting functional connectivity between the DLPSD and this ACC. So what you're seeing here is where the ITEPs were strong after single pulses to the DLPSD. The DLPSD seed is where the stimulation site was. And the outline in black is where there were strong ITEPs. And this, in this subset of patients, we saw strong functional connectivity in the same brain regions, in the ACC, suggesting that there's a strong functional connection there. Across all brain regions, we also saw this, that those that showed a stronger ITEP effect also had stronger functional connectivity. We further examined this DLPSC-ACC interaction using our electrical stimulation CCEP mapping. So in two patients that had the TMS experiments and electrical stimulation experiments, we applied single pulse electrical stimulation to the DLPSD and explored responses in the ACC. And this is what we saw. So single pulses to the DLPSD did elicit strong evoked responses in that same ACC region. And finally, we performed a parietal stimulation control. So again, if these DLPSC responses, if these responses to DLPSC TMS really just activating the salient network and it's just painful stimulation, we should see a similar response with parietal stimulation. And here, the parietal TMS does have a widespread activation pattern, but doesn't activate those, those ACC regions. So I hope to have shown you that TMSIEG is safe, that you do induce local evoked responses, but it's only about 20% of the electrodes and only somewhat explained by the electrical field. However, TMS does reliably evoke downstream responses in the ACC and insula, and that these two regions are functionally connected defined through resting functional MRI and electrical stimulation. And a positive parietal TMS does not show this activation pattern. So there's a lot more to do here, um, including research-grade amplifiers that will allow us to look within the first 25 milliseconds after the single pulses of TMS, those response curves, dissecting the sham stimulation a little bit better, and exploring the neural effects of single and repetitive TMS trains. Now, I'm going to move fully non-invasively and move out to the 30,000-foot view and talk about treatment and research that's done in the TMS field. So currently in the clinic, we target the DLPSC using scalp-based targeting methods on the skull. We dose based on motor thresholding, and then multiplying that by 1.2, or 120% of the motor threshold. And we treat in an open label way for 30 days. Research in this field, targeting is a really hot topic. And um, Sean Siddiqui, Mike Fox, Nolan Williams, Ellie Cole have pioneered this space where they think that there is a specific spot within the DLPSC that is functionally connected to other brain circuits, in their case, the subgenual cortex, that will allow for better treatment response. Dosage is, the research going on there is, there's discussions 
about adjusting the dose based on the scalp to cortex uh, distance. That if there's a large, larger distance, you should treat with more than 120%. Um, and treatment research is around the number of treatments per day. That's the big advance that Nolan Williams and others have shown that applying 10 treatments a day can complete a, an entire treatment protocol within a week and show really nice clinical results. So our research lab takes a slightly different approach. We believe in this targeting of the DLPSC, but we think we can do this in the clinic with TMS EEG. We dose, but we are dosing based on this multidimensional tuning curve. So we're finding those stimulation parameters that push around this potential biomarker maximally. And that's our starting point in terms of treatment. And then in a closed loop adaptive way, we can update those stimulation patterns as we go. Dive into a little bit more detail here. Currently we're doing open loop stimulation. No EEG recordings, no fMRI recordings. It's one size fits all. It's blind to one's physiology or plasticity. Hope to move towards to this version 2.0, which is adaptive and closed loop, where we start with a certain pattern, but by recording the EEG, we can update those responses. And so this would be updating the treatment based on the biomarker changes, based on one's physiology and plasticity, and it will hopefully be faster and much more effective. So we developed this biomarker and moved towards real-time solutions using TMS EEG. We can simultaneously perturb a brain region using TMS and measure that brain response with millisecond temporal resolution. This is a clinic-ready tool that is relatively inexpensive. We've developed automated artifact rejection um, tools to allow us to clean the signal. I'm not going to go into detail, but we get these multi-peak evoked potentials. When you plot this on the brain, you get these beautiful maps of causal brain responses. Didn't fully show the right way, but it's really the first time non-invasively in human neuroscience where you can get causal and directional maps of brain connectivity. So using TMS EEG, we want to develop this brain biomarker or brain biomarkers to track brain change that relate to clinical symptoms. We want to understand how stimulation parameters affect brain biomarkers. And then we want this real-time monitoring and closed-loop adaptive treatment solution. So in terms of the biomarker, we want to find something with really high signal-to-noise that measures brain excitability, is quantifiable in the clinic, and changes with TMS treatment. We think we might have one of those markers. Call that the P30. So it's P30 after a single pulse of TMS. When you record the EEG in the local area of the TMS, you see this positive response. P for positive, 30 for 30 milliseconds. Again, that localizes to the ipsilateral side of stimulation. And it's thought to reflect local excitability. We know this from pharmacology studies, where when you add a, uh, a voltage-sensitive sodium channel blocker, you can decrease that P25 or P30. We also see this measurement within intracranial EEG. I showed you this map before, but within 20 to 40 milliseconds, you see a first deflection of the evoked response after a single pulse of electrical stimulation. So we have three lines of evidence to suggest that this P30 might be a potential biomarker to move forward with. The first is a randomized clinical trial in depression, where we randomize patients to either four weeks of real TMS or four weeks of sham TMS. And we measured before versus after using TMS EEG, we measured these evoked potentials. We performed this analysis at every peak, and we only saw significant effects at the P30. The effect that we saw was a group by time effect, group being active versus sham, time being pre versus post treatment. We saw this effect locally in the left prefrontal region where we were treating, 
and in the left parietal region. When you break this effect down, we saw a significant effect of time in the active, but not the sham treatment. The P30 actually gets suppressed after treatment in the active, but not the sham group. And this P30 is localized to medial and lateral prefrontal cortices. Now, although it's a small study with a relatively weak effect, we also saw that the degree of the P30 suppression related in the active group to the degree of clinical improvement. Again, low correlation, take that with a grain of salt. The second study we have is a single day TMS study with healthy controls where we performed a single day of 10 hertz stimulation and saw again a suppression of this P30 in the parietal region on the left side and didn't see that in a control V1. The third line of evidence is the intracranial work that I showed you before that I'm not going to repeat, but we saw a modulation of the evoked potential around 30 milliseconds um, in regions predicted based on anatomical and functional connectivity. So this is great, but the problem with the P30 is it has extremely low signal to noise. It's just really low amplitude. It's very close to the single pulse. So mechanistically, we can start to understand it, but it has, it has low, uh, low voltage. So how do we improve upon that? So any time you have low signal to noise, the two ways that you boost the signal to noise are by reducing the noise or increasing the signal. So we're going to try to do both. So in this study, we're reducing the noise. It's well known that TMS induces many off-target sensory responses unrelated to the direct effects of TMS. This manifests in the N, or negativity, at 100 milliseconds, and P, positivity, at 200 milliseconds, but the auditory evoked potential can really start as early as 30 milliseconds. So we need to remove this to get sound interpretation of our results. So we performed this study in 21 healthy controls. The goal is to minimize this Vertex N100P200. We use standard masking in the field. Um, so typical metrics, typical methods are taking the auditory click from the TMS and playing it continuously. And that's noise masking. And using a foam that separates the TMS coil from the skull to minimize bone conduction. We added two more pieces here. One was earmuffs. These are passive noise reducing headphones that construction workers and others will use to reduce the sound effects of TMS before it gets masked and the interstimulus interval timing. So typically you apply about 100 or 200 of these single pulses and then average them to get the above potential. These are typically jittered to reduce the potential that there is a plasticity effect over these 100 pulses. We showed in our studies, at least, we didn't see that plasticity effect if we didn't jitter. And we hypothesized that by jittering, you're increasing the saliency of the signal, and so therefore increasing the N100 and P200. The bottom line here is in this attenuate protocol, as we call it, we were able to suppress this N100 and P200 considerably compared to standard masking techniques. We also were able to reduce the scalp sensation and loudness that participants um, perceived. So the other way to boost SNR is to increase the signal. And these are just two very early studies, uh, but you can do this two different ways. You can do this analytically or experimentally. So analytically, just to give you a sense of this, single pulses of DLPSC TMS and measuring with the scalp EEG, you see this type of response. Each color is a different brain region. All I want you to get from this uh, trace is that within this 30 millisecond time period, it's really complicated. And what people typically do is pick one metric, let's say the peak from 25 to 35 milliseconds in this brain region to explore further. But there's lots of information in there that we're missing. So I think a multivariate approach will be more valuable in extracting relevant features and boosting that signal to noise. So I'm not gonna go into detail,
but we're exploring the following analytic considerations, including what time window do you choose? What peak picking method? Do we look in time or frequency space? And finally, region of interest. If we just look at region of interest, it's complicated. We can look at a single channel or multiple channels. We can look in sensor or source space. And finally, we can go back to the experiment itself and say, let's get a higher signal to noise to begin with. And so we're doing a grid search and an angle search around the DLPSD to find what angle and location boosts the P30 the best. So I hope to have shown you that this P30 is present intracranially and non-invasively. It reflects cortical excitability. It gets depressed after a single day and after four weeks of treatment. And it may be related to clinical outcome. And finally, we think we can boost the signal to noise by suppressing sensory potentials and optimizing experimental and analytic approaches. So once we potentially have this biomarker, we need to explore the stimulation parameter space. Just to give you an idea here, this is what 10 Hertz treatment looks like, where each line represents a stimulation train, each row represents a stimulation session or a day. It is impossible to compare this treatment to five other treatments in the same individual. And we need to reduce the dimensions here. We need to ask simple questions like, do single TMS trains elicit acute brain changes quantifiable with EEG? How long lasting are these changes? How do these changes differ based on different stimulation parameters? And how do these changes build with repeated stimulation trains? So we'll explore 10 hertz, but we'll also look at 1 hertz and theta burst. We'll also look at this unexplored space. This is the multiple dimensions that I showed you before. We're gonna start by tackling the three most simplest ones. We're gonna look at a single stimulation train and measure the electrophysiology. And then we're gonna break that train down and explore this multidimensional tuning curve and ask questions like, how does this tuning curve differ based on location, between subjects? How does it differ after an intervention? How does it differ when you add multiple of repeated trains. There's lots of different avenues that this can go and is necessary in order to develop closed loop solutions. And on that, once we potentially have the biomarker, once we understand how that biomarker is pushed around with various stimulation parameters, we can then start to think about these different closed loop algorithms. So we've developed the methodology to clean and monitor these early biomarkers in real time. This is in close collaboration with Scott Linderman in the statistics department. We are currently testing these closed loop algorithms, Bayesian optimization, reinforcement learning, control systems theory in silico and in vivo to demonstrate the proof of concept. And then we will be applying these algorithms to evaluate single day brain changes and then multi day brain changes and then explore those brain changes as they relate to clinical symptoms. So I hope to have shown you that interventional psychiatry is this emerging field with tons of potential, but we have a ways to go. We need to develop and refine these brain biomarkers, map these biomarkers to stimulation parameters, and then develop these closed loop treatment solutions. And then we'll have personalized treatment that we can apply to any brain circuit and any neuropsychiatric disorder. I want to thank you all for listening. Uh, I want to thank everyone that made this happen. This is a huge group approach. Everyone in the lab, all of the research participants, collaborators, and funding agencies. Thank you for your time.